Next case on the agenda this morning is case 2021-G-022, Chambers versus Blystone et al. We use the chair members of the commission. In place that alleges the respondent properly, the respondent failed to properly reflect all campaign contributions and campaign finance reports. Uh, his response was submitted, which was circulated to all of you to the allegations uh, well as uh, also with a request for a hearing from the council. Uh, initially, as I indicated to you, the commission received a request for a continuance for, for the preliminary review from the council sort of complainant, but that was subsequently uh, removed. Uh, my recommendation is to set the matter for hearing. Uh, Mr. Pullins, counsel for the complainant, is here. And Mr. Brown, counsel for the uh, respondent, is here. If the commission would like to hear from them. All right, let's, let's look at that. Council. Ms. Pollins, would you go ahead and enter your appearance, please? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you. Good morning. My name is Scott Pullins, Ohio Supreme Court number 0076809. I'm an attorney representing Sarah Chambers, a complaint in this matter. Um, as a preliminary matter, uh, I would argue that the respondents have not filed a proper response under oath. Um, <clears throat> Ohio Elections Commission rules require and respondents have been informed twice by the letter they must file response under oath. A unsworn motion to dismiss filed by an attorney without affidavits from all the respondents, in my opinion, is not a proper response and should be disregarded by the commission. If the commission does choose this, to consider this motion, I would urge you to find it wholly without merit. Um, it's really clear that this commission has had clear jurisdiction over candidates, campaign committees, treasurers, and other individuals and entities. Um, to my recollection, since at least 1996 in its present form. Um, more importantly, from our perspective, is nowhere in this response is an actual denial of the allegations in the sworn complaint. Uh, there is a separate affidavit from the candidate's wife and treasurer that's full of easily provable factual errors, but again, no actual denials of the allegations. Let me speak briefly to the complaint, um, uh, if it's a pleasure of the commission. Um, Sarah Chambers was a former campaign manager for the Friends of Blystone campaign. Uh, other persons that provided sworn statements were also key leaders in this campaign. Uh, there were some unsworn statements uh, that were part of the complaint, but it's our plan to put those individuals under oath if and when a full hearing is held and if their testimony is needed. Uh, we have also recently secured the cooperation of Joanna Swallen, uh, Joe Blystone's former lieutenant governor running mate, who will also provide sworn testimony at a full hearing. Uh, Mrs. Swallen withdrew her candidacy and left over these very same issues. Um, to sum this up, the complaint, Mr. and Mrs. Blystone and his campaign committee have taken in vast amounts of cash um, for the campaign in violation, in our opinion, of many campaign finance provisions. Ohio law requires them to itemize cash contributions that are in the amount of $25 to $100 and file them with their reports. Ohio law prohibits them from accepting contributions in cash of more than $100 per person. Contributions of under $25 may be reported as a lump sum. However, the campaign must still keep records of these contributions. The Blystones allege and reported that they raised approximately $88,000 in cash contributions of under $25. That was over one third of their contributions raised, and we believe they simply cannot and will not document these contributions in any way. Right, sir. What they have appeared to have done to us at events after event is to pass buckets around and have people simply throw cash in the buckets. There's no documentation, no donor cards, no limit on how much cash they've taken from an individual. Just throw it in the bucket. And guess what? We report it all as contributions of $25 and under. Mrs. Chambers and the witnesses strongly believe the Blystone campaign has no records whatsoever for these $88,000 in cash contributions that they received 
and reported as being under $25. They also strongly believe this act was deliberate um, and have testified with sworn affidavits that it was. Sworn witness after sworn witness have alleged they personally witnessed or they themselves made contributions of over $25, which were never reported. Sarah Chambers alleges that she made contributions um, not by cash, but through a credit card via their website in excess of $13,000 and has provided the receipts and the bank records to prove it along with their sworn testimony. But yet the campaign has not reported these transactions during the time period they took place. Complaints Exhibit 1 is a video of Dr. Doug Frank making a $100 cash contribution at a public event that was never reported. Since the complaint was filed, we have attained another video and we will show it if possible at a full hearing of Dr. Doug Frank making a second $100 cash contribution with video that was also never reported. Respondents argue these contributions were props. Commissioners, with all due respect, that assertion in itself is a deception and, in my opinion, a clear violation of campaign finance laws. They are also wholly factually incorrect in their affidavit. Doug Frank did not hand Joe Blystone a $100 bill. He counted out five $20 bills, and it's all on video. This campaign, in our opinion, can't tell the truth even when they're caught red-handed on tape. We certainly look forward to putting Mr. Frank under oath at a full hearing. Members of the commission, we have videos, we have bank statements, we have multiple sworn witness <clears throat> statements from former campaign officials that illustrate numerous violations of Ohio's campaign finance laws. We believe that we have provided more than enough in this sworn complaint to show that probable cause exists for multiple violations of Ohio's campaign finance laws. At a full hearing, we believe we'll be able to prove these violations of Ohio's campaign finance laws. Um, we would urge the commission to set uh, matters for full hearing, and um, I'd be happy to take any questions that you may have. Thanks, Mr. Paul. Any questions of Mr. Paul by the uh, commission? Thank you, sir. Thank you, Commissioner. Brown, do you want to go ahead and do your appearance on behalf of the respondent? Yes, sir. It's very Josh Brown. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would you like to speak, Brown? Would you mind? Uh, yes, we can hear it better. Sure. Well, those of us who are blocked by line of sight, it's much easier. I mean, it's a good job. We have lots of things to refer to. <laughs> All right, thank you, uh, commissioners. Um, the first big problem that we face is that the uh, complaint is not acceptable uh, to the commission. Um, <clears throat> OAC 3517-1-02-A1G requires the complaint to reference the statutes that it's alleging were violated. The complaint only references two statutes. One of them is 2921.412. That is a theft in office statute. So that particular um, statutory reference has to be discarded because it only refers to people that are in office. The only other statute that I found referenced in the complaint was 3517.10A4. Uh, that is a statute in the ORC that requires the treasurer to file reports and basically requires the treasurer to file those reports accurately. That statute is not within the jurisdiction of the Ohio Elections Commission. Therefore, the Ohio Elections Commission lacks jurisdiction to adjudicate this dispute. <clears throat> the commission's jurisdiction is laid out in 3517.153. References six statutes and none of them are 351710. There is a reference in there that allows the 
Ohio Elections Commission to issue a advisory opinion or legislative recommendation regarding to part of that point 10 statute. <clears throat> so therefore, um, this complaint cannot be accepted uh, because of a lack of jurisdiction. The OAC statute says shall, and so um, the complaint is uh, under an absolute requirement to reference the statute. So um, we would ask that, first of all, that it be dismissed on that basis. Um, if you went through my uh, the motion to dismiss that we filed, you'll find that uh, there are basically 11 categorical <laughs> motions to dismiss. So I'm going to go over some of the most important ones and uh, respond to uh, some of the complainants, um, uh, the things that the complainant referred to in his remarks. Um, <coughs> he said that uh, there's no denial. Um, so there, the affidavit does deny uh, any wrongdoing. And so that's a, a sworn statement under oath by the treasurer. Um, and then there's the issue of what needs to be denied. So I'm getting what I'm doing right now is I'm asking you to dismiss on jurisdiction, but let's say you don't want to dismiss on jurisdiction. So uh, now I'm talking about the merits of the complaint and the substance of the uh, allegations made in the complaint. So once we get to that, we deny wrongdoing uh, and we've done that. Treasurer's done that in uh, sworn writing. Um, the we did talk about in my motion to dismiss uh, improper parties. The campaign committee is the treasurer. If you look at the definition of campaign committee in the statute, it says whoever receives and expends money for the campaign, um, and that can be either the candidate or another person. So for this campaign, they have a treasurer. So the campaign committee is the treasurer. So the treasurer's denial is uh, sufficient. Um, and there, and uh, that's just the beginning of the argument on that. If we want to get deeper into that, we can. Uh, in, in, in terms of the issue of whether a campaign committee is a, uh, uh, a corporate or also referred to as a legal person. But I don't want to get too much into the weeds in this presentation here. So there's a, there is a law that says that no person can give more than $100 in a single campaign. That law is 3517.13. The problem, and now that can that particular statute is within the jurisdiction of the um, the Ohio Elections Commission. However, the Ohio Elections Commission cannot take up that issue because it's not referenced in the complaint. However, if you did choose to take it up anyway, the statute makes the person who makes the contribution the liable party. Treasurer is certainly not liable because um, nobody expects a treasurer to go out and be the one at every table at every event taking the checks. Nobody expects the candidate to be out at every table at every event taking the checks. So the treasurer's only responsibilities under the code are to take the money, deposit it, and report it accurately and to write checks for the campaign. So the respondents cannot be liable for the $100 limits because the statute makes the person liable and not any other entity. Now, if you read that entire statute, you'll find that there is liability on the campaign committee, candidate, and other parts of that statute. It's one of the only parts of the statute that actually says person. So it's clear that the legislature chose to make the person <laughs> liable. Um, the $25, that is an exception. So if you look at the treasury responsibilities in the code, uh, the $25 exception is 351710B4E. That is a reporting requirement. That is not a gift requirement. That requirement is placed on the treasurer and said the treasurer does, that is an exception to what the treasurer has to report. 
that is not a requirement on the gifts. So if we're at the table at an event in you know, Newark, Ohio, Treasure's not there, Candy's not there, a volunteer is taking money. The requirement in the statute is not on that event. The requirement is on the treasurer to report accurately. And this is an exception. The $25 is an exception to that requirement. That is why the treasurer cannot be liable for that transaction out in the field. If you're on, a, I know some of you worked on campaigns, especially the senator. Um, the, the treasury candidate, they're not out in the field always uh, taking those donations. So that requirement um, is a requirement on the people that are taking the donation. And the treasurer's only job is to take that money, <laughs> deposit it, report it accurately. And if I really would like those three words to really stick in your brain. Take the money, deposit it, report it accurately. That's all that, this, that the Ohio Revised Code poses on the treasurer in terms of their duties. Uh, for those of you who may have not worked on a campaign, very rarely do you even see the treasurer during a campaign. Treasurer's only duty is take the money, deposit it, report it accurately. Treasurers are very rarely out in the field taking money. Um, and the reason why is because that is their only duty. Take the money, deposit it, report it accurately. There's no uh, testimony that that wasn't done. Um, and I will address Sarah Chambers' uh, particular um, allegation in a minute. That speaks to the buckets issue as well. Treasurer is not responsible for a volunteer going out and placing a bucket out at an event. Uh, there's nothing in the code that makes the treasurer responsible for that. There's nothing referred to in the complaint. There's no statute referred to in the complaint. They just the complaint says they did it. We don't think it was right. This is a generalized um, accusation with no detail. I want to speak to one of, and getting to that issue. I want to speak to one of my other reasons for asking you to dismiss this complaint, which is this complaint uh, pleads fraud. And fraud in American law has to be pled with particularity. Nobody knows that better than Mr. Kreitz. I know that. <laughs> so the, there are two types of rules. There's malum per se and there's malum prohibitum. And it's one of the first things you learn in law school. The reason you have to plead fraud with particularity is a malum per se rule. Which means in malum per se, something is made illegal <coughs> or improper by a rule because it's inherently wrong. So murdering somebody is is wrong whether there's a rule against it or not. So that is why um, murder and the law against murder is a malum per se law. Uh, filling out a form to get your 501c3 tax status is a malum prohibitive rule. There's nothing inherently wrong with getting tax status without filling out a form. It's a rule for the purpose of ordering society. If you look at my um, motion to dismiss, there is a section in there about pleading fraud with particularity, and it quotes the House Supreme Court in explaining why pleading fraud with particularity is a malum per se offense. It is inherently wrong to plead fraud without doing it with particularity. How much particularity is needed? At least enough so that the <coughs> respondent can know what the allegations are against them, what rules they violated. In this case, um, we don't have sufficient detail. That is explained in detail in the motion to dismiss on a case by case basis. I said this is pled with not enough particularity. Here's the things we would like to have had <coughs> that would make it sufficient <coughs> to have been pled with particularity. We would like the place, the amount, what did you actually see? What did you not see? That is malum per se, that is by uh, principle and fairness required in the complaint. All right, and then we get to uh, Ms. Chambers' donation, which was referred to in the complainant's remarks. Ms. Chambers admits that she was refunded money from the campaign 
She provides no context for the money that she allegedly gave to the campaign. Um, and then she says, this is what was reported. In order to plead with particularity, she needs to explain why that amount that was reported wasn't correct. And her complaint doesn't do that. So it doesn't give us enough information to respond because we don't even know how much she alleges she was refunded. And we don't know what the context was of the money that she was that she gave was, you know, was it an in kind where she was. Um, uh, for example, uh, buying some hot wings for a, a fundraiser or something like that. And that would make a big difference in terms of the reporting. The uh, treasurer has said I've reported everything. I deposited everything I took. <clears throat> I deposited it and I reported it accurately. That's her requirements. That's what she testified she did. Um, so the Clinton uh, referred to um, $100 cash donation with Dr. Frank. Again, the statute makes would make Dr. Frank the reliable party, not the campaign, because it says the person who makes that donation in the statute. However, um, there is testimony in the affidavit that the hundred dollars was meant to encourage people at the event to give money and the money was given back to him. Um, that it was a presentation. There is nothing in Ohio law that requires somebody to uh, report money that you didn't take. Treasure has a report what was given to her. If that money was never given to her, it doesn't have to be reported. If it was given to a person in the campaign and they gave it back, they burned it, whatever they did with it, Treasurer's not responsible for that. <laughs> Treasurer's only responsible to take it, deposit it, and report it. Treasurer's not responsible for what happens out in the field. So even if this was a violation, campaign's not liable, treasurer's not liable. Maybe Dr. Frank is, I don't know. Plus, um, there's a testimony in the affidavit that nothing wrong was done anyway. Uh, another one is, um, there's a video reference in the complaint. We've never seen it. We have no idea what they're talking about. That's classic, not you know providing enough uh, particularity. There's no description of what happens in the video other than uh, allegedly um, Joe Blystone takes money. Again, even if it's true, failure to state a claim because uh, Treasurer's not liable for any of those transactions. Now let's say um, we ignore all this, these layers of things that I've put in front of you. The let's say the candidate is liable and uh, there is a statute um, that says that the camp that the uh, uh, candidate should not knowingly uh, take donation that violates uh, campaign finance law. The penalty for that is you take the amount that was improper and you double it and that's your fine. Uh, so we have a first problem is there's no way to calculate. These are generalized accusations. There's no way to calculate what it, the improper donation was. Even if it was, um, we're talking about um, uh, a minor problem if proven. Uh, the uh, affidavit for the treasurer says that if there is a mistake, I will correct it. So it's an easily correctable mistake if it isn't a mistake at all. And furthermore, it's a, it's a small fine, basically. So um, as soon as we uh, have proof that there's a mistake, then we'll address it. Um, my complaint, I tried the best I could to make this as easy as possible to read. You'll see I indexed the, the motions to dismiss and I also indexed the, uh, the allegations. So I'm, I'm glad to take questions on that. I just want to take a second to make sure I didn't miss anything in my remarks. Next time, okay. Okay. Yeah. Last thing, um, there is even a. So you can you don't have to dismiss the entire complaint. You can dismiss counts as well. And uh, so I uh, asked for several counts to be dismissed for uh, one violation or another. But one of the biggest ones is we have a, a witness in this complaint who isn't even named, and um, that's a violation of uh, due process because the. Uh, uh, respondent has the right to confront witnesses, even in civil complaints. I, I referenced the uh, law on that in the in the filing. 
uh, but it's also a violation of the rule against hearsay. This classic hearsay is an out of court uh, statement by someone we don't even know who it is. So um, uh, the complaint, like I said, throughout has uh, numerous things that fail to uh, comply with the statute. Uh, one of them is there are a number of affidavits that are missing, so that can't be accepted. So those have to be thrown out. Um, one big one is the complaint itself, and I wasn't sure um, at first what I was looking at. I've, I've never seen a complaint structured like this before. So, and being a civil litigator, um, I look at a lot of complaints and uh, even pro se complaints, and I just uh, I, I didn't know exactly what I was looking at. If you look at the bottom of the complaint, you'll see that there is a signature and a notary. Um, that's page 10, if you have it in front of you. In, and at the top, there is a reference of, I'm doing this on personal knowledge. Now, of course, any affidavit has to be done on personal knowledge. And I objected and asked for it to dismiss on the basis there was no affidavit because I saw the signature at the bottom and a notary with no affirmation to personal knowledge, which is required by the statute as well. And then in the response I saw, oh, at the top of the complaint, there's a, I'm saying this on personal knowledge. Well, even if that's all true, which it is, there, it says personal knowledge at the top and it's signed and notarized at the bottom, the, that witness cannot testify to the things inside that complaint. You can't testify to what other people saw. You can't testify to what other people said. You can only testify to what you saw on personal knowledge. Therefore, the entire complaint must be dismissed because it lacks proper affirmation. Uh, I'm glad to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Brown. Questions of uh, Mr. Brown? <clears throat> and it's a lot of information. <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> Mr. Richter, is anything you've read or change your opinion regarding the setting of the spray hearing? No. All right, any other questions of Mr. Richter? What about the Motion. I move that we set this for a hearing. In a second. Second. Second by Mr. Rook. For the discussion on the motion to set for a hearing. All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries by 470. That will be set down for a hearing. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you, Commissioners.